Welcome to the Oakley Hill Museum of Chance. I'll take you on a guided tour of the Oakley Hill Museum of Chance. We're going to dip into several rooms and see snapshots of the lives of extraordinary people. You'll see examples of the most basic way of living and of great human achievement. We'll stop in one or two rooms a little longer. Uh, the Darwin rooms are toward the end of the corridor. Uh, there's a lot to see, so the tour will take over an hour. Uh, I've left you a handout of interesting things to look up later. Well, I'm very lucky to be here. We're all very lucky to be here. One in a million sperm won a race to fertilise each of us. My dad had two narrow escapes in his first 18 months. He was born in South Africa during the Boer War and a mortar landed in the garden, smashing the windows. Fortunately, the glass missed his pram. Life was getting too dangerous, so his mum Katie took her mother and four children back to England. On the journey back in the Atlantic, the ship rolled and so did a baby on the deck. Only a flying rugby tackle by a crew member stopped my father falling into the waves. In the 1920s, he was in Mesopotamia fighting Turks when a bullet whistled past his ear. So those were just three lucky escapes. And Dad's father, Archie, was lucky at least twice to survive life in the Navy. If any of those things had gone the other way, I wouldn't be here tonight. In fact, I wouldn't be here without many people I'll introduce you to. Let's look at the first room in our Museum of Chance. This is the most recent. So this is my immediate family tree with um, dad in the middle. Now I've got a, a special pointy thing. Look. There's my dad in the middle. Um, uh, his first wife, Rosamond, who died in 1945 on the left, and my mother, Ruby, on the right. And my brother, Robin, over there, um, from my dad's first marriage, and my sister and I on the right. Um, so that's my immediate family. So this was taken by my father. Uh, that's mum in the middle, uh, my elder brother Robin here on the right, uh, his wife Jennifer uh, over the other side, and the two young ones are me and my little sister Angela. Robin worked on the Thames Barrier for the Greater London Council. Angela was born in Greece, where I spent my early years. Dad worked for the Foreign Office and was away a lot, so Mum took me for many adventures on buses and boats uh, to places like Volos and Vuliagmeni, and I loved the lizards darting about and exploring rock pools. Did you ever do that? I, lo I love rock pools. Anyway, we lived near Athens, and Mum kept great photo albums. Um, so this is the Acropolis, which you'll recognise, although I'm sure some of the area around it is much more built up now. Um, that's Mum and Dad uh, carrying me down Mount Pendeli, which is uh, not far from Athens. That was uh, our car, the Consul, delivered to Greece when I was four, and I learnt to drive it when I was 20. Um, it did. That's Meteora, stunning place. Priests used to be hauled to the mountaintop monastery right up at the top in a rope basket years ago. Now, now they go up on a, on a donkey. Um, I had a bad year in 2007. Um, I lost my mother in January and my sister in May, both from breast cancer. Uh, and I miss them a lot. Their friendship, intelligence, kind nature and great sense of humour. That left one close relative, my brother Robin and his wife Jennifer, um, and this was his 80th birthday in 2012, Robin Jennifer and my partner Prilly in uh, Dimchurch. Um, and I'm wearing this t-shirt um, which says, plenty more fish in the supermarket. <laughs> well, I'm an endangered species, which is why I'm wearing it. So anyway, back from Greece, we moved to Eltham, South East London in 1956 and Angie became a nurse, I became a graphic designer, later an editor and an environmentalist. Dad died in 1985 and when mum died, exploring what I'd inherited from both families took a while. So the Museum of Chance has a storeroom which gives a glimpse into some great lives. I discovered exciting people and stories Robin didn't know 
although he had an idea of a Darwin connection. That's my mum feeding deer at Knoll Park in Kent. My mother Ruby was a scholar and linguist and studied archaeology of biblical lands and collected pottery and I found big books of pressed flowers she brought back from Greece. She played hymns and gospel songs on piano accordion. She ran Sunday schools and played piano for a girls dancing class till she was 80. She wrote many amusing letters and I'm so pleased that I taped her talking about her family. When inviting cousins to her funeral, I realised I was the only living person who knew how they were related. Mum's mother, Violet Collison, was the youngest of ten. And I'd met several descendants, uh, and I drew up the family tree. There was music. Mum's father, Bert, played a banjo in a glee club. Granny Violet's father, Will Collison, started a music shop in Woolwich and made and sold pianos. The last piano maker in the UK closed in 2009, but I have a Collison family piano. My mother Ruby was born in 1916 during the war. She never knew her grandparents who started the music shop. They died of flu the year she was born within one day of each other. This is Ruby with parents Bert and Vi at Hearn Bay in 1928. Bert was practical. He made me roller skates from pieces of aluminium. He'd lost three brothers in the First War and didn't talk about that, but he was amusing and full of knowledge. Aged 70, he could still do a handstand. <laughs> I, I wish I'd known him better, but he died when I was 11. In her teens, Vi was given a violin, a, played in an orchestra. When Mum died, I found it. A friend who played in a quartet sent me to get it valued by experts. It was made in Venice in 1896 by Degani. Beers recommended I pay £600 to have it professionally restored and insure it for 15000 I loaned it to the Royal Academy for use by a top student. She now plays it on tour with the London Philharmonic and invites me to concerts. My mother and grandmother would be amazed that this violin has travelled across the world and is now insured for £40,000. Mum told us of walking to work in the Blitz through the ruined London streets. Through hard work and language skills, she was at the Foreign Office, where she met my father. He'd been released in 1943 from prisoner of war camp in Austria. In 1944, Dad was appointed UN Chief of Mission to Albania to negotiate with di dictator Enver Hodja to bring supplies to starving people. He knew his wife Rosamond was ill, but she told him to go. In 1945, three weeks after arriving in Italy, he heard she died. Robin was only 12 when he lost his mother and had to stay with Dad's sisters. Dad had taken Ruby with him, my mother, and she became displaced persons officer. A stressful job helping repatriate Greeks over the border in the mountains, using lorries with snow chains and finding no one to meet them and watching heart in mouth as Italian mothers carrying babies and small children climbed rope ladders onto a big ship about to take them across the Adriatic. Another photo from Albania. Mum's sense of humour shines through her photo albums. The chap on the left is called Col. Uh, the other two must be donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> After working on Mum's tree, I moved on to Dad's. Excuse me, it's very dry speaking in this hot weather. My father Darrell has a big room in the museum which we'll have to leave for another time. But his book, An Englishman in Albania, is out of print but you can find some of it on the web um, and you can find it via your handout. In the 1920s, Dad retired from the Indian Army after marching up the Tigris in Mesopotamia to Mosul, much in the news recently, to defeat first the Turks, then the Kurds. In 1977, not even knowing Dad had been there, I got a job as graphic designer for Mosul University. I got married, drove through eight countries and spent a fascinating year in Iraq. And it's hard to believe the breathtaking Assyrian sites I saw, which had survived 3,000 years, are destroyed. 
I gave an evening of poetry and song with photos of Iraq, uh, which is on YouTube. Again, that's on your link. Um, but my room at the museum, uh, like my father's, has yet to be prepared. This is Dad with Rosamond and his mother Katie. Rosamond died, as I said, in March 1945, and he married my mum in late 46. So Dad was 50 before I was born. My sister was seven years younger. Dad's family jumps back in time more quickly than most. Many people my age have grandparents born between, say, 1880, 1920. Does anyone have a grandparent born earlier than 1880? One. <coughs> okay. Um, when? when? 71. 71. Okay. My grandfather, Archie, was born in 1846. 170 years ago, in the early Victorian era. That's Archie, aged about 22. Uh, and our great-grandfather, his father Benjamin, was born in 1809, the same year as Charles Darwin. This is Archie, aged about 42 in 1888. I think I looked younger than that when I was 42. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a guess. That's, that's, it might be within two or three years. When he retired from the Navy, he married Katie in South Africa. Archie thought too many people were trying to make their fortune from diamonds. He tried to farm ostriches and lost his money. And I have a tube of feathers. When that shell landed in the garden during the siege of Kimberley, Katie, the children and her mother fled to England while Archie stayed in South Africa as a civil servant. Katie was a very able woman. She played classical piano and had her own composition published. C. Oakley Hill, Katie for Catherine. <coughs> she set up home in Bedford, where there was a good school, as you know, <laughs> and brought up five children. Um, that's two of Dad's sisters, uh, Dots and Madeline, in a punt in Bedford. After the children left school, and Katie's mum died in 1913, she left Bedford. They lived in Waldeck Avenue. This is a 1902 map. Waldeck Avenue's up there. I don't know if you know Bedford very well. You won't find that now. Um, it was a German name, Valdeck. And so in 1917, it was changed to Warwick Avenue. In Luton, they missed this. We still have a Waldeck Road. Yeah. Let's go into the second room. This is Katie and Archie's family. So my father was the youngest of five. These, are, these uh, two rows, the bottom rows, are the children. Um, so we've got Concy, Dots, Madeline, Percy, and my father. Uh, as Archie was in South Africa, Dad didn't see his father until he was eight. In 1906, Archie came home for a month and took the family on holiday in Malvern. So this was taken then, it was the first time there'd been a sort of kind of reunion family photo. And uh, his sister Connie was there and probably took this photo, uh, sorry Archie, Archie's sister. Um, and uh, one evening he sang two songs and um, Connie was in tears because she hadn't seen him for years. After Bedford School, Percy, at the back, uh, went to work for 10 years in the customs office in Shanghai. Later, he was a barrister offering legal aid in Rhodesia, where Concy, on the right, um, joined him as a teacher. She'd lost the man of her life, Concy, uh, on the Lusitania, which was returning from New York in 1915, when it was torpedoed by the Germans off Ireland. Percy died the year I was born. I remember Dad taking me to Camberley to see the three white-haired aunts, that's the remaining three girls there, uh, who never married. Concy, in her 70s, said, uh, she was wearing glasses by then, said, let's go into town, and set off, jogging down the pavement. Madeline, on the left, who you saw in the punt, was obviously good at steering. She was head of the Royal Naval School, from 1933 to 1960. 
It was at Twickenham until it was bombed in 1941 and she oversaw its transfer to Hazelmere in Surrey. Um, and here she is with uh, Lord Mountbatten handing out prizes uh, and also with the Queen Mother. And in Malvern, um, Archie and family stayed in the house where Charles Darwin had bought his 10-year-old daughter Annie, hoping desperately the waters there could save her life. She was very ill, but they couldn't. She probably had TB. Um, that's her grave um, in Malvern, reading A Dear and Good Child. Archie retired and returned to England in 1912. So back in Bedford, when asked um, by a passerby where the chiropodist was in Bedford, he replied, quick as a flash, there's the Bunyan Hall. It, <laughs> it's probably close by. <laughs> right, so here's Archie, um, first lieutenant in his 20s, looking rather like me at a fancy dress party at the same age. Um, he had some exciting adventures in the Navy, and this is all in his own words. which I've edited down from uh, his account of a day, one day, in 1872. Amongst cannibals. I was in one of HM ships, cruising amongst the Solomon Islands to inquire into any outrages that we'd heard of committed on natives by white men from vessels pushing the not unlawful labour traffic. Also reports of traders being murdered by natives in retaliation. We kept our boats out of range of poisonous arrows, only landing where they appeared friendly. A favourite trick was to entice a boat in by holding up coconuts or waving. As a boat touched the beach, they'd fire arrows at the crew and hide in the bush. We anchored off one island to fill our tanks with fresh water and repair our vessel. The natives were shy at first. Two three-man canoes paddled toward the ship and stopped within a hundred yards. But after holding up pipes, beads and bottles, they came alongside, offered bananas and sent other canoes. So we soon had a crowd alongside, eager for trade. We asked for cockatoos that were flying about. Um, several were brought the next morning to add to the screeches and noises from our extensive menagerie on ship. Besides yams, bananas and plantains, at some of the islands we got fruits such as mangoes, a nut like a Brazil and pigs and fowls. I showed them pictures of animals they couldn't have dreamt of, a pig being the only creature they possessed, though I've seen dogs at some islands. Nothing could induce them to approach a sheep that we tied up on, store, on shore to graze, though we stroked it to show it was harmless. I'd show them the works of my watch, or enjoy their mingled emotions of fear, pleasure and astonishment at the first glance of themselves in a looking glass. That's an aerial view of the Solomon Lions, where they were. And remember, this is 1871 or two. A native who'd been on a trading boat for two years and was lucky enough to get back to his island had been christened Jim by his shipmates. He told us there was only one king of this big island. Some of us were anxious to visit him so we made up a party of four including the doctor. Promising to be back before dark we left in the morning with inquiries from messmates if we'd made our will. We took him in the boat to show us the landing place after five miles rowing in baking sun, um, we reached a small bay where we found 200 savages led by the king's son. Most had weapons, a spear, club or bows and arrows, and the king's son carried an elaborate spear and wore large tortoiseshell rings in his nose and ears and a most extravagant headdress. Climbing a steep bank through thick bush we reached a large open space with several fine huts. At a big one in the centre sat the king with attendants. This was the prey house. 
It was 20 feet high, and inside was the largest bark canoe we'd ever seen, more than 100 feet long, decorated with shells, and a man and a woman's image carved from hard black wood, like ebony, with large pearl shell eyes. Jim said it took 60 men to paddle and 100 to carry it to the beach. His Majesty was the stoutest man we saw. We gave him a wooden pipe, a large piece of tobacco, a long bladed knife, and I crowned his woolly head with an elaborate smoking cap, which pleased him immensely, although he received our, grif our gifts ungracefully, as if they were bribes. There was one remarkable character to whom I mentally gave the office of Prime Minister. A toothless old man with shriveled face, dingy red hair, hideous leer and cunning expression, baffling all description. He was always at the king's elbow, offering advice into his ear. I still think that he was tempting the king to butcher us by reminding us how powerless we were. Sitting about on mats were the king's wives. We counted about 30. Um, we gave the favourite queen some beads. We ate our sandwiches and sardines, uh, drank from our flasks, and gave the king a share, which he seemed to relish. He asked Jim if our beef sandwiches were composed of white man, and we said to tell him uh, we didn't indulge. Uh, he gave an ogre-like grunt and seemed lost in contemplating our pitiable want of appreciation of one of life's greater enjoyments. We couldn't refrain from laughing at the many faces he made at the whisky which we gave him undiluted. After lunch, we asked to inspect the premises and were accompanied by Jim, the king staying behind. Um, we were followed by children of all sizes and ages calling out, Kai Kai! Um, and this meant uh, they were keen to indulge their cannibalism on us. Uh, this left little doubt that we were not the first white men they'd both seen and tasted. At the back of the king's house was a small shed. Jim said it was used to keep Kai Kai in. On beams stretching across the shed were several black human heads in various states of preservation. Jim told us they were killed only eight days before in a fight with a tribe of a neighbouring island. On leaving, we were each presented with a weapon and a bunch of bananas. We began our march accompanied by natives carrying our spears in single file along a narrow path through the dense bush and were caught in a tropical thunderstorm. The ground grew slippery and our last half hour's march was in the dark, save for an occasional patch of dim light from the young moon breaking through a gap in the dense overhanging foliage. I fancied every shadow or rustling was a lurking savage and expecting every minute to feel the point of a spear or arrow, which occasionally I did from the native behind me. Um, and uh, I had kept my hand on the revolver in my pocket until we reached the beach uh, near our ship. An armed party was being got ready um, to go in search of us. A few weeks later, we learnt that our friend the king was, uh, had a habit of feeding and fattening his prisoners, and only three weeks before our visit had enticed four of the crew of a small trading vessel to pay him a visit under pretense of friendship and prospect of trade, and massacred them. So that was one of Archie's adventures. <laughs> A year before this, Archie was in the famous uh, shipwreck of HMS Magera. Uh, there isn't time for both this evening, but I'm repeating this tour of the Museum of Chance for Friends of Museums on the 10th of October. So if anyone wants to go along there, uh, I'll be telling that story then instead of his day with cannibals. Um, so let's go into Benjamin and Catherine's room. Right. Um, so. Where did the Oakley Hills, what a funny name, where did they begin? Well, Archie's father, Benjamin, um, in red there, my great-grandfather, was a key person in my history. In 1799, his father, above at the top there, uh, Benjamin Hill, had married Sally Oakley, starting a dynasty of Oakley Hills. My great-grandfather was their second son. Uh, I'll say a word about John and his son Percy in a minute. Sally was from a respected family in Wigmore, Herefordshire, near the Welsh border, and her parents lived until their 90s. Sadly, Sally died aged 39. This is uh, the wonderful lichen on uh, her grave, which says, uh, this is Sally Hill, younger daughter of 
Um, Mr. J. Oakley Hill and wife of Mr. Benj Hill of Ludlow died 21st May 1814 in, in the 39th year of her age. But, uh, rather charming but sad. Um, and uh, Oakley House uh, is on the left. Uh, and to give you a sense of the surrounding countryside, um, it's rather nice. Um, that's the view from Wigmore Castle on the hill above the church. Sally's first son, John, was headmaster at Monmouth and later a vicar. And his career ended at the charming little church of Little Rollwright in Oxfordshire. Um, <laughs> John's son, Percy, was a vicar too and dedicated this new pulpit in memory of his father. Um, and it was open. Yeah, some, some are, fortunately. Um, this photo of Percy is in the church at Burgate in Suffolk. And Percy wrote a short history of each village he was vicar, which was several. Um, and this is the Norman church tower um, at Upton with Fishwell, lovely name, uh, Norfolk, where his history of uh, that village uh, is on display. And he also wrote a booklet on the Royal Wright Stone Circle near that church uh, called Temple of the Sun. Percy had several children, including uh, Connie, who worked for the Foreign Office, and Dulcie, who wrote amusing short stories. Um, so I've got four of her books of uh, little moral tales. And uh, then there was Gerald, a vicar in Somerset, who wrote a joyful letter in 1943 uh, on Dad's release from prisoner of war camp. Um, Gerald had children, and that dynasty continues. After, son, after John, Sally had Benjamin, so that's my great-grandfather, born in Ludlow. Uh, he became a vicar too. Uh, and uh, that was his first church at Watton Underwood in Bucks. It's not too far from Buckingham, a bit south. Um, and this is the painting of the church, um, which is probably painted by Catherine, his wife, my great-grandmother. Um, so that's the church at Watton Underwood. Um, and age 28, he became chaplain um, to Richard Temple, first Duke of Buckingham. And Temple died a year later, and at 29, um, in January 1839, Benjamin oversaw his funeral. Temple was fat and unpopular, but grandson of Prime Minister George Grenville. Yesterday, the internment of the late Duke of Buckingham took place in the family vault at Watton. This was conducted in as private a manner as possible, attended by only a few nearest relatives and friends, and such of his tenants as might desire to attend an old friend and landlord to the grave. In consequence, only his family and friends who were visiting Stowe at the time of his grace's decease, and the Buckinghamshire tenantry, about 450 in number, um, followed his remains on a gun carriage. The body was received at the church by the Reverend Benjamin Hill, the rector of, rector of Wotton, and the service was performed in the most impressive manner by the Reverend Mr Hill. And the, the Duke of Buckingham lived just down the lane from the church at Wotton Manor, and later owners were Sir John Gielgud and most recently Tony Blair. Anne, Duchess of Buckingham, presented Benjamin's wife my great-grandmother, Catherine, with a sewing bag with her embroidered monogram, C-A-H, 1841. And uh, that is my great-grandmother, Catherine, or was. Um, so she married Benjamin. She was born in 1817 and has quite some ancestry. This is her letter. Uh, it's written by her, my father and my uncle, when she was aged 14, about the death of both her father and uncle. And uh, this, this, this letter sort of demonstrates her um, ancestry, which I'll get to in a minute. Her father, Reverend John Theodore Archibald Reed, which is where my grandfather got his name from, uh, a Scot, was rector of Leckhamstead near Buckingham. And Here's the rectory opposite uh, in 1830, um, sadly now a pile of bricks, um, painted by the same person who painted Watton Church, probably Catherine. And uh, JTA Reed formed a collection of Bibles in almost every known tongue, and he was one of the first to promote smallpox vaccine, saving thousands of lives by persuading people to be vaccinated. 
During a severe outbreak in 1804, he inoculated 1,000 people a month and continued to vaccinate people for 25 years until his death in 1830, a list of 30,000 names. His four-page pamphlet was translated into all European languages and circulated by the governments of Russia and Prussia. That's the back page. Um, and all of these countries made vaccination compulsory and smallpox became almost unknown. And Catherine's uncle, Reverend John Langham Darrell, was senior magistrate of the county, in which capacity he was impartial and humane, ever espousing the cause of the poor. He was for 52 years vicar at Stowe and 50 years vicar of <coughs> Lillingston Darrell. Now, some people like their family trees all symmetrical, and I've done pretty shapes, which may be confusing. Um, so I've got a pointer here. <laughs> um, right, so Catherine's letter shows a direct line from her, what's that? There we are, um, right back to Sir Richard Temple. So that's JTA Reed, the vaccination man um, who married um, Catherine's mother, Anna Maria. Her father was Henry Darrell. His parents were Anne Langham um, and Richard Darrell. Anne Langham's father was Sir John Langham of North Hants, who married Maria Temple and Sir Richard Temple. Um, so Sir Richard Temple of Stowe, at the top, is my great time six grandfather. He was the richest man in Britain but three generations later, sadly for me, his fortune was squandered by a gambler. Um, Sir Richard Temple's son, um, over there, also Richard, inherited Stowe in 1697, aged 21. He became an MP and later Viscount Lord Cobham, whose friends included author and politician Jonathan Swift and poet Alexander Pope. If you think that's complicated, pay attention now. <laughs> Right, um, Sir Richard also had a daughter, Hester Temple. Um, now she married Richard Grenville. He became Prime Minister. Their son, not on this tree, it's all too complicated. Their son George also became Prime Minister, a second Grenville. Their daughter, another Hester, so that would be one, down one, married William Pitt, who became Prime Minister. Their son, William Pitt the Younger, also became Prime Minister. So in two generations, this corner of that family spawned four Prime Ministers. Um, two Grenvilles and two Pitts. And I recommend a film um, you can find free to see on the internet about Pitt the Younger. It's on the handout. Um, my father was given the name uh, Darrell, a name you'll have noticed, and Reed, another name you'll have noticed, uh, Darrell Reed, Oakley Hill, and his brother Percy's second name was Langham. Uh, Sir Richard's son uh, employed Capability Brown to design the gardens. Walking round the grounds of Stowe is great fun. This is a stained glass window in the church, hidden by trees, where John Langham Darrell was vicar for 50 years and you come across a series of delightful follies, such as the Temple of Worthies and the Palladium Bridge. Uh, anyone who hasn't been there, it's, it's, it's good fun. Um, Alexander Pope is just around the corner of that one, who is obviously a friend of uh, the temples. There's um, Walter Raleigh, um, Isaac Newton, Shakespeare, all, all kinds of um, people there. Um, right, um, now I believe we might have reached the first Darwin room. So here we have my father, his father Archie, who had the adventures uh, in the Navy, um, and his mother, Catherine Reed, who married Benjamin. Right. Um, my great-grandmother, Catherine, was the youngest of five, but I've made this a bit simple because I just want to introduce you in a minute to uh, these two, um, George and Anna Maria. Um, her eldest sister, Anna Maria, no, incidentally note the name because I'll be coming back to him, George Veren Reed. Um, her eldest sister, Anna Maria Reed, who married Thomas Hussey, right. Um, 
she was a superb watercolour painter of mushrooms. And her sister Frances was rather good too, well, I haven't shown her. Um, and two lavish volumes were published of their illustrations of British mycology with 90 colour plates, mostly by Anna and a few by Frances, known in the family as Fanny. Um, you know, an unusual achievement for women in those days. So that's one example of uh, Anna Maria's paintings. That's another one. I love this one because it looks to me like a little duck at the back with, with boxing gloves. Um, <coughs> and that's just great as well. Um, so uh, there are some links so you can look her up um, uh, on the handout. Uh, so Anna Maria delighted in the mud and rot, uh, searching for unusual and exotic fungi. She hoped her work would inspire future mushroom enthusiasts, especially young people, and that they would find an interest in nature and seek the charm in everything. She wrote both scientific and witty prose and sent specimens to leading mycologist Reverend Miles Barclay, and he named the genus of fungi after each sister. In 1831, Anna Maria married Reverend Thomas Hussey, vicar at Hayes, Kent. He was an astronomer and friend of Charles Darwin, close by at Down. And that's the rectory where Anna Maria and um, Thomas spent a lot of their years and Charles Darwin visited. Um, and at the back, Anna Maria painted mushrooms and Thomas watched stars from his observatory. He's thought to have been the first, Thomas Hussey, to suggest the existence of the planet Neptune. He was declared bankrupt in 1853 and left with Anna to stay in Paris, where sadly she died aged only 48. Catherine and Anna's brother, you remember the middle uh, of that last slide, was called George Varenne Reed and he was curate originally up in Buckinghamshire with the, re the rest at Tingewick and often accompanied his father on long journeys to perform vaccinations. George, down in Kent, in Hayes, became a popular rector after Thomas Hussey in 1854. And Charles Darwin was looking for a tutor for his second son, George. And because he knew Thomas and um, George's elder sister, Anna Maria, uh, he met George Reed and he liked him a lot. And so he let him tutor his first son, George Darwin, and that worked so well, he also employed George to tutor his three younger sons, Francis, Leonard, and Horace. And examples from, uh, of letters from Charles Darwin to George. 1855, uh, Georgie likes his journey to Hayes. 1859, George is top in the lessons tutored by Mr. Reed. The family will move to Seaside because of his daughter Henrietta's health, and when they return, he will be glad to send Leonard twice a week for tutoring. 1860, sends payment for Francis Darwin's tutoring, inquires about arrangements for Leonard, who is slow and not well, to attend with Francis, uh, asks whether he can have a cutting of Mr. Reed's carrion-smelling arum, which he needs for an experiment. 1864, Horace Darwin making progress, but tires easily and does not like drudgery. That's um, Emma Darwin, um, Charles's wife, and uh, a letter from Emma in 1887 to Mrs. Reed after her husband's death uh, shows the Darwin's great respect for Reverend George Reed. All four boys became successful. All four were knighted. And George and Francis became published scientists. Right, okay, so that was George, uh, the first one taught by George. Uh, George Darwin taught by George Reed. That, of course, is uh, Charles Darwin and Emma. Um, so these are their sons. Um, so George, Francis, Leonard and Horace. So all those four um, chaps who were knighted and sons of uh, Charles Darwin uh, were taught by my great-grandmother's brother. Right, um, in 1939, when my brother's wife, Jennifer, was 13, her school was evacuated to Cambridge, where she visited uh, Sir Horace's house. Um, and uh, he was dead then. It was called The Orchards but she remembers it as delightful and reminiscent of Down House, and she met Horace's widow, Lady Darwin. Sadly, the place was later sold and demolished. Um, one of George Darwin's children was Gwen Raverat, 
um, who I'd just like to mention, just because I think she's great, um, a skilled woodcut artist and author of a delightful book called Period Peace um, about her childhood in Cambridge and her eccentric father, George, um, who was taught by my great-grandmother's childhood. Um, and uh, here is uh, Jennifer, who met Horace Darwin's widow, um, with my brother uh, at Down House in 2010. Uh, good place to visit. And that's me by the mulberry tree that Darwin planted. <laughs> and there's a Strelitzia uh, in Darwin's greenhouse. Um, I've brought some cards of this I've made up if anyone's interested. Um, and uh, here's a short poem that I, um, I wrote after our visit uh, called Down House. Down house, a sunny April day, a quest to find our past. We walked the walk, the sand walk, dappled shade, grand trees, the five bar gate, and fields which sloped to distant woods, inspire to chase discoveries he made. Glass house, banana, and tomato plants that weren't. Strelitzia, proud purple orange bird, rich red, the glowing elephant's ear, bright as setting sun. The bit part humans play seems quite absurd. Backgammon, oboe, piano, billiard table, giant chess. My brother threw the quoits and bowled the balls. We shared the recreation, turned great studies into fun. The ordinary lives in hallowed halls. Long past the days our ancestors live simple worthwhile lives. Our passive lives today are worlds afar those times of fundamental values, function and respect, when worms listen to music in a jar. <laughs> Along the corridors we sought connections, making sense of evolution's horse ride to our days. Walled gardens, concrete islands where the tendrils cannot grow, ex-human planet will find other ways. <laughs> and um, when I took my brother to visit Hayes in 2015 and saw the drinking fountain dedicated to George Reed, I noticed in the church a plaque to the Pitts who lived nearby. Um, so there you are, Pitt the Elder and, and Younger, and, uh, and that's a stamp with Pitt the Younger on, and as I say there's a really good film which you should try and look at. Um, so we've got four Prime Ministers in that bit of our family tree. Um, one of George Vernon Reed's 12 grandsons was this character, Trelawney Darrell Reed. He was born in 1886 and uh, this was painted by British art artist Augustus John. Trelawney wrote two books about the Dark Ages, the Battle for Britain in the 5th century and the rise of Wessex and he was curator of the Pitt Rivers Museum in the 1930s. I think he'd have liked to be in my Museum of Chance he wrote a book about the game Shove Hapney. A miracle of games, he said, combining demands on hand, eye and brain with a minimum of paraphernalia. The board should be of mahogany. The object of the game is to shove three halfpennies into each of the nine beds before your opponent can do so. No easy matter. On reaching heaven, unless I find it already played there, I shall introduce it to the highest notice. <laughs> a, a letter from Augustus John, 1942, refers to his portrait of Trelawney, um, a British archaeologist and neighbour, and says John's London studio was hit by a German landmine. And a 1943 letter says that due to the blitzing of Buckingham Palace, he had to interrupt work on the portrait of Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, who you saw earlier with my dad's sister Madeline at the Royal Naval School. Uh, when Trelawney's local 12th century church in Dorset was restored, after timber was riddled with Death Watch Beetle, uh, he painted the rep replica heraldic shields. And in 1907, aeroplanes were new and frightening, and farmers worried about them, frightening their sheep. When last week, early trippers went out to Bournemouth on Good Friday to gawk at army stunt flyers somersaulting in the clouds, some of the landed gentry sat down and penned letters to the Times, in which they used the word sacrilege, underscoring it twice. Yet one took sterner measures. One Trelawney Darrell Reed, 38, rich, retired and genteel. From a thicket, Mr. Reed 
blazed up at one of the stunting aeroplanes with both barrels of his favourite grouse gun. The plane, flown by the squadron leader, soared on, but on landing he found many a lump of lead in its left wing. The first case known of a man being charged with attempting to murder an aviator while in flight occurred in England on April the 15th, when Mr Trelawney Darrell Reed, a farmer, was arrested and, uh, was arrested and accused of flying sorry, a firing at W.H. Longston, a pilot, with intent to kill and murder. I desire, said country gentleman Reed, to make a statement. Uh, I wouldn't if I was you, sir, said the local magistrate. Come now, I'll make your bail as easy as the law allows, £300. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, <clears throat> this is the room dedicated to Benjamin Hill's great adventure. My great-grandparents, as you've um, discovered uh, Catherine Reed and Benjamin Hill married at Tingewick in 1841, lived at Watton Underwood, um, now home of Tony Blair. Um, family tree. <clears throat> so there they are and they had four children. Benjamin, Archie, uh, Annie, my grandfather Archie uh, and Connie uh, who kept her mother's articles, um, pocketbook with births, marriages and deaths and they are uh, her grandfather JTA reads cowpox paper and a marriage certificate in English and Spanish. Hmm. Archie joined the Navy. Benjamin on the left went to America. Sorry, that's not my great grandfather, that's his son, that Benjamin. Um, he went to America. Um, hmm. Whence this wanderlust? Well, their mother, my great grandmother you saw the painting of, Catherine Ann Reed, died of TB in January 1852, aged just 34. So this devastated the family. And Benjamin, a rural vicar, took up the post of chaplain to the British consul on the other side of the world. He took his four children with him, Benjamin 10, Annie 7, my grandfather Archie aged 6, and the youngest Connie aged 3, and two of his wife's sisters, Etta and Fanny, the junior mushroom artist, as nannies. And the perilous journey from Liverpool around South America, uh, where Darwin's ship the Beagle was nearly lost in a storm 20 years earlier, was 8,750 miles. And through the Magellan Straits, it took 25 days. Once the 48 mile Panama Canal was opened, uh, it cut 1,500 miles off the journey, 7,200 miles in 20 days. Um, Valparaiso is where they were headed. So they came all down through the, through the Magellan Straits and up to Valparaiso. It means Paradise Valley. It was discovered by a Spanish captain in 1536 who named it after his hometown. Uh, and its golden age was the 19th century. In 1820 it became an open international harbour large immigration of English, German, French, Italian and Spanish, a key Pacific port for ships to and from America. That ended with the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914. In 2003 it was declared a World Cultural Heritage Site by UNESCO. <laughs> There's an early drawing, the road to Valparaiso. Um, so on August 11th, 1852, a clipper named Grecian arrived from Britain with 330 passengers. Two died en route and one had fallen overboard. It docked in Valparaiso, Chile, land of earthquakes, volcanoes and enterprise. And Benjamin and his family stepped onto a new continent. Soon after they arrived in Valparaiso, Benjamin's elder daughter Annie died aged seven. He lost a little Annie as Darwin had. They took a photo of Annie's grave, then one of Connie, in case something happened to her. She was only three. Um, this was an early process using glass slides. After two years, Benjamin married again. Arabella Garland was there with her brother. Her uncle, Horatio Bland, drew up the marriage settlement. He was a world traveler. Horatio Bland, his collection, including marine fossils, was used to found Reading Museum. Benjamin, Arabella and family travelled home in 1856 and Arabella became Connie's mother. That was taken in the 1880s. So 
Connie is in on Arabella's left there. That's Arabella, who married Benjamin, second wife. Um, and uh, Arabella is pouring from a teapot, uh, which belonged to Connie's real mother, Catherine Darrell, made in the late, late 1700s. And here's my brother's wife, Jennifer, with that teapot, with the Darrell crest. Their father, Benjamin, marrying again, must have been harder for the two boys, and they chose lives of travel. Young Benjamin became obsessed with the Virgin Mary, converted to Catholicism, changed his name to Father Edmund, wrote religious poems, and travelled South America as a missionary. Archie joined the Navy, and if he was seeking adventure, certainly found it amongst cannibals and on a famous shipwreck. Connie became the highly respected Miss Hill, um, superintendent of the teacher training college at King's House in the close Salisbury, now a museum. Here's Connie on the chair. Um, and uh, Dad's sister, Concy, training there on her right. Um, and Dad's sister, Dorothy, um, became bursa there. So the, quite a few of the family there in, uh, in Salisbury, opposite the cathedral. Oh, that's the cathedral. So, um, my friend commented, that's a rather large hat you've got. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, wh while in Valparaiso, Benjamin became involved in someone else's adventure. I wondered why we had at home a large etching, which is now in the Museum of Chance, um, of Fairfax Moresby, Vice Admiral in the Royal Navy and Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific. Well, the capital of Papua New Guinea is Port Moresby, named after him. In Benjamin's first year at Valparaiso, 1852, he met Moresby and twice met George Hun Nobbs. Nobbs had been in the British and Chilean navies, wounded in battle, briefly a prisoner. In 1928, he'd settled on Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific and became a teacher and tailor. For years, life had been hard there under a dictator. And Moresby had visited Pitcairn and was generous to the survivors of the 1789 mutiny on the bounty who were living there. This is a photo of, um, well, an etching of Pitcairn. But problems at Pitcairn included lack of food, drought and illness. But the islanders wanted an uninhabited island to retain their community. Moresby recommended and funded Nobbs to oversee their relocation to Norfolk Island, north of New Zealand, bigger and with domestic animals. And Benjamin heard their stories. He met Nobbs' son and daughter who were educated in Valparaiso and advised Nobbs on his ordination as chaplain to the Pitcairn Islanders. In 1856, 67 years after Fletcher Christian and Fle fellow mutineers um, had sought refuge from uh, having been mutineers on the bounty at Pitcairn, 194 people took a five-week journey with much seasickness from Pitcairn to Norfolk Island. And I have a letter from Moresby to Nobbs written from Exmouth in 1854 and also a letter from Nobbs to Benjamin um, from Norfolk Island, where they'd moved to in 1857, saying that, toward the base of the mountain there is plenty of timber, but hardly any running water. We have to rely on three or four deep wells. No rain has fallen for four months, and the island doesn't promise the fertility we'd expected from the glowing reports, but we hope to have yams and sweet potatoes in six months. There is great demand for wool, and whale ships will come for fresh beef and mutton. The Governor-General of New South Wales is to visit, and Norfolk Island is to be separated from Van Diemen's Land and appended to New South Wales. Uh, we send our love to Mrs Hill, yourself and the dear children. Archie and Constance, I suppose, are at school. I should be glad to hear from yourself and dear good Miss Reed and Miss Fanny. Nobbs later married Sarah Christian, granddaughter of mutineer Fletcher Christian. Okay, Benjamin returns to Britain with Arabella and um, he became vicar at Norton, a village on the Welsh border where Arabella had five children, Percy, Nettie, Annie, Amy and Tom and I inherited this photo of the old church. The church was enlarged 
to how it looks today in 1868. So amazingly, this photo was taken before 1868. And here's how it's looked ever since. And you can see the vicarage behind it, which was also built in about 1866. Norton was an absolutely beautiful place for children to grow up with wonderful views of the Welsh hills. That's from the back of the vicarage, above the stable block where Benjamin kept his horses. And this vicarage is now rated one of the best B&Bs in Wales. <laughs> Victorian features have been kept, like Benjamin's bookcase. Arabella's first child, born in 1860 at Norton, was Percy Garland Hill. He grew up here in the vicarage. So intrigued was he by tales of Valparaiso that he went to live as a farmer in Chile. Not an easy life in the Andes. Cold winters, droughts, earthquakes. One year, a flash flood washed away some of his land. He married, and these were his two sons. Quite a photo. He took quite a lot of photos, and uh, I've got an album. Um, which will be installed in the Museum of Chance, of course. And he painted scenes of Chile. A talented man, I think. And uh, here are Benjamin's four daughters. Connie on the right. That's from, uh, from his first marriage, from my great-grandmother. And, um, sorry, I lost my place. Um, and uh, Annie on the left, Nettie at the back, who died aged 39, and Amy, seated. Amy was another adventurer. She enjoyed archery visited her Catholic brother Benjamin in America and trained for nursing in California, back in England, becoming head of Bath Nursing College. There she is in the middle. She also painted and visited my father in Albania. Arabella's youngest, Tom, decided he'd be a sheep farmer like his brother Percy, but in Australia. Um, and that's Tom. And he wrote an account of a typhoon and of his solo 1,000 mile ride from Adelaide overland to the south coast. And I wrote a song about that ride, which is on YouTube, and uh, that's on your link. Um, and Annie went out to stay with him for two years as well. My brother remembers Annie, Amy and Tom. In 1874, despite pleas from the people he served as vicar for 14 years uh, in Norton, Benjamin left Norton to be the first occupant of the vicarage at Chaldon Herring, a lovely name, in Dorset, where Arabella grew up. This church was painted by Connie or Amy. I'm not sure which one, both talented. Um, it still looks the same, but with big trees behind it and more graves, including the one for Benjamin and Arabella. Benjamin's Bible is still in the church, 1879, because he died in 1885, living two years longer than Darwin. His achievements don't compare but Vickers were the centre of the community and he was popular, respected and led an eventful life. This is my dad in the middle, in the Indian Army in 1918, on leave at Quetta, a rare moment out of uniform. Now a very dangerous place on the Afghan-Pakistan border. In most photos, dad looks rather serious. Robin, my brother, had never seen this, so I turned it into a birthday card with a short note. What ho, old chap! On leave at last! Would like to let fly with some ripping yarns, but only time for the quick birthday salute and to pop this card into the post horse saddlebag. <laughs> I've never seen Robin laugh so much. Dad met Robin's mother, Rosamond, when he was in India. He married the brigadier's daughter. Uh, so this is the wedding back in England. Um, Rosamond's sister, uh, Kay is uh, on the right, and her best friend on the left, uh, talented woodcut artist and poet, Ruth Hedger. Um, and, ah, oh, I see we've reached the second Darwin room. That's good. Well, Rosamond 
was descended from Sir Richard Fletcher, senior commander under the Duke of Wellington. Fletcher fought in many wars, was twice wounded and collected a few medals. That's Wellington. Um, and that's some of Fletcher's medals. Um, he died in 1813, Fletcher, fighting the French in northern Spain in the Siege of San Sebastian, posthumously awarded the rare Wellington Medal, which came down to my brother. And uh, after a wow moment on the Antiques Roadshow in 2010, when these medals were estimated at £50,000, he donated them for safety to the Royal Engineers Museum. William Darwin Fox is my brother Robin's great-great-grandfather. But we didn't know this until 2010. Darwin Fox and Charles Darwin had a common grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. He was a wonderfully creative man who first came up with the idea of evolution. Although Darwin doesn't seem to have read his books, so he seemed to have come, come up with it separately. Um, other people came up with the idea as well. Um, Alexander Humboldt, who was a great influence on Darwin. Um, two years ago, I was at the launch of Andrea Wolfe's European best-selling biography uh, about hum Humboldt. And there was a chap called Robert Chambers, who published his Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation in 1844, anonymously fearful of religious backlash. And Darwin's contemporary, Alfred Russell Wallace, whose fans include Sir David Attenborough and Bill Bailey, the comedian and musician. Wallace lived in Hartford. Um, there's a plaque on his door. Uh, and he spent seven years in Indonesia writing the Malaysian Ar Archipelago. He discovered the Wallace line, which separates Asian from Australasian fauna and flora, explained by continental drift due to tectonic plates, which of course he and Darwin didn't know about then. They were first proposed in 1912 by Alfred Wegener. Wallace's paper, though, propelled Darwin into finishing his long-held theory. Rosamond's father was Captain Gerard Fletcher Sanders. Here he is with Robin um, and with the dog. <laughs> and here's the family tree that takes Robin to Fox and Fletcher. Um, sorry, it's a pretty shape again. Um, so, pointer time. Right, so... You've got Robin, my father, and his first wife, Rosamond. Their parents, Gerald Sanders, the brigadier, um, who you just saw with Robin. Um, his mother was Eliza Ann Fox, and she was the daughter of Harriet Fletcher, daughter of Sir Richard Fletcher, and the Reverend William Darwin Fox. Okay? Um, And I've got a poem by Robin, which I find quite moving, really, um, which he wrote in 2010 uh, when we discovered this connection. Climbing around in the family tree. The great reform acts through and the railways start. Miss Catherine Darwin, writing at her table to her brother long at sea, tells of the birth of cousin William's little daughter. I, writing on my lap, say, Eliza Ann, firstborn of William Fox and Harriet Fletcher, my great-grandmother, and I know the outcomes. This letter, Catherine writes, it's here in print, nearly 200 years of deep time later, round the world, stored and now published, just like everything her brother wrote or else received. Mere fames for Nelson or John Lennon, this man's an ism. The outcomes, Harriet, dead in childbirth, six years on. Eliza Ann herself did not survive the birth of her 11th. I recall that child, stooped, arthritic, old. And here's the photo. The photo, one of Eliza's sons, his hand upon my shoulder, last year of his life. That was the photo you just saw. My hand upon the dog. Eastwood. The few defend our damaged skies. And now I want to travel back and ask my grandfather, Eliza's son, did you see Darwin? Did he speak to you?
Fox, born in 1805, was Charles Darwin's cousin, four years older, a committed amateur naturalist. He was Charles's mentor at Cambridge. That's Christ College, which Darwin and Fox attended. Just inside the gate, that's me with uh, Darwin. Um, Fox taught Darwin all about beetles, going on many expeditions and introduced him to the inspirational professor John Henslow, with whom Darwin spent so much time that the other dons called him the man who walks with Henslow. So the Reverend William Darwin Fox and Charles remained lifelong friends and wrote each other over a hundred letters, including some to and from the Beagle during Charles's great adventure. Often Charles's letters would end with happy memories of their beetling expeditions. He wrote from Valparaiso, you are one of, my, one of the indirect causes of my coming on this voyage. You made me an entomologist and introduced me to Henslow. When Fox became ill before dying in 1880, Charles wrote to his son that he'd never known a kinder or better man. And here's Fox's descendant, my brother Robin, on the sand walk at Down House, where Darwin re relaxed and did much of his thinking. That's Charles as a young man. In 1835, the Beagle was in Chile. Charles felt an earthquake in Valdivia. The motion made him giddy. Two weeks later, sailing 200 miles north, he saw the result of the earthquake and tidal wade at Conception, 100 miles south of Valparaiso. He described it to Fox. A most awful spectacle of desolation. There is not one house standing. And this same scenario was repeated in 2010, when coastal towns were devastated. And uh, that, of course, is the Beagle. One of Captain Fitzroy's tasks was to drop off the three natives they'd taken from Tierra del Fuego to introduce to the civilization of London. Back among their tribal groups, they reverted quickly to their previous existence. Another of Fitzroy's assignments was to map the hundreds of islands don't know if you realised how many there were around Tierra del Fuego. Now that's a map of, of it. The um, Magellan Straits come through there, where um, Benjamin's ship would have travelled. Um, but they, Darwin and co, Darwin and Fitzroy were mapping around this area, and this is the Beagle Channel through there, named after the ship. Um, and uh, here's a painting of the Beagle Channel. At Tierra del Fuego, the crew of the Beagle had a very narrow escape. A gale began to blow up and they took shelter. Mountainous waves arose with spray 200 feet high. Two waves broke over the ship. That's the Beagle listing in a storm. So they cut away one of the whale boats and they knocked open the portholes to let the water out. If a third wave had landed, the Beagle and its crew would have been lost. Many of Fitzroy's and Darwin's papers and specimens were ruined, but the Beagle is a prime exhibit in the Museum of Chance. Because it arrived safely home after its five-year journey and the world's understanding of science, geography, geology and natural history was vast, vastly enriched, and uh, these are some Darwin stamps. Uh, up the top it says, surveyed by Captain Robert Fitzroy and the officers of HMS Beagle, 1835, Galapagos Islands. Um, and there's some more stamps with some of the things Darwin's known for. And Darwin um, and the Beagle in the middle there um, are still on our 10 pound note for the moment. Um, although I hear it may not be for too long. Uh, and you hear Fitzroy's name every day on the shipping forecast. And that's a map of the Beagle's expeditions about which Robin's great-great-grandfather received letters. Uh, so, there have been some big people in my family. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's me and a friend uh, at the Natural History Museum. And... Uh, that's uh, the last two of our family at the, uh, the Darwin's residence, um, Downhouse. Huh. 
Oh, is that the time? Um, so uh, that's the end of uh, today's tour of the Oakley Hill Museum of Chance. I hope you've enjoyed climbing, <laughs> climbing my family tree. Thank you. Let to rock.